Welcome to a conversation with Bill Ackerman, Head of Human Resources at Fidelity Investments. I'm Ken Freeman, Allen Question Professor and Dean at the Boston University Questrom School of Business. Bill, we're very pleased to have you join us today. Uh, maybe we could start with a, a toss-up question. Uh, tell us your story, your career background. Yeah, so uh, I'm a liberal arts major. Um, right out of college, I joined the uh, GE Financial Management Program and uh, working in a steam turbine factory, um, doing a bunch of finance assignments, and then I sort of progressed inside of GE to different things, uh, including their internal audit staff, which began to open my eyes up to lots of things. Um, and then one of my first two choices was how much longer do I stay with GE because they move you around. So uh, for family reasons, I had to make a bolt. Um, so I joined Fidelity 17 years ago, uh, again in a finance role, uh, in the venture capital side of things. And then um, I sort of said, hey, I want to do something else. And I ended up doing web hosting type activities for, for um, one of our companies in Europe. And then that led to a few things. And um, this is called managing your career <laughs> or having it managed for you. So uh, I ended up doing strategy and planning for uh, a couple of years. And then two years ago, I was asked to lead the HR function. So. Um, not a traditional career path, but one that's been exciting, and it goes back to my um, liberal arts days of sort of trying things and mm -hmm. learning what you like and what you don't like. Uh, has there been a defining moment or moments in your career to this point? There were two. One was um, deciding to leave GE to go get my MBA. Uh, that was a calculated risk, um, but luckily I had great support from the employer. Um, so I went out and did that. And the other defining moment was truly a hard one, which was deciding to leave a company that I had been with for a while, since literally the week after college, built my whole career, network, the whole deal, but put family first and decided to leave and start all over again at a, at a different company, which is where I am today. But that was um, not easy. And did you ever think you'd be running human resources at one of the very largest financial services companies in the world based on your background? And that sounds so intimidating when you say that. Um, no, I never did. But then again, I, don't, I never had really a career plan. Um, my plan was, was nothing more than try things, do a good job, and uh, good opportunities will present themselves. So no. Even up till two years ago, I didn't think this was my plan. <laughs> and if you ask me how long I'm going to do this, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Of course. That's interesting. Now, Fidelity, as we said, is a leader. It's a leader in the rapidly changing world of financial services. Yep. Today, what, what differentiates Fidelity from the competition, would you say? So it's a very good question. Financial services tends to get sort of blurred in the people's eyes. They all kind of sound the same. Um, but Fidelity is differentiated by a couple things. It's got a culture that's full of, we're obsessed with the customer experience. And so our scores on net promoter score and things really, really outweigh the competition. So we treat our customers really well. Um, we have a broad set of offerings. Um, that would be the other, the other differentiator. And we really take care of people at different life stages. So most people's investing or money management starts when they work for an employer and in a 401k, and we're the biggest 401k administrator. Um, if people have more money after that, they can do an IRA, and we're the number one IRA provider. Um, if they have other assets, they can do other things. So we have a full suite of, of products. Um, but it, to me, it comes down to we are totally obsessed with the customer experience. And I'd pick that as the, um, the number one differentiator. And you mentioned the culture, uh, yeah. partly driven by the customer experience. Yeah. What is the role of values in, in Fidelity? Family-founded firm? Family-founded firm, still run by the family, uh, 70 years uh, in the making. Um, values to me are, we, we have this acronym called RICE, so responsibility, integrity, compassion, and excellence. Um, and I double click on integrity because the, the, a lot of companies say it, but not everyone does it. Um, and if full of integrity, it permeates all the way through. Uh, employees pick up on it in their first two weeks. It's all about doing the right thing. Um, values is generally um, innovation has been one. We innovate in every single thing we do, whether it was you know, 30 years ago, check writing on money market funds, being the first online brokerage. Um, basically inventing the 401k market as we know it now. So innovation is, I would say, a value. Um, it's sort of the chairman has always had this Kaizen philosophy of making everything better. Um, simple things like bringing money in, moving money around people's accounts, administering their accounts, giving them their money back, all in the spirit of continuous improvement. So I would say innovation, again, a word that companies use, but um, because we're private, we can tinker with things. 
and make sure they're as good as possible. So we're never satisfied with our existing process. And when you look at the, the environment of financial services, yeah. it, uh, I imagine it's a challenge to, to uh, deal with circumstances when perhaps there are integrity issues outside of the sphere of fidelity where right. there's perhaps some form of a rub off on the industry at large. Yeah. How, do, how does you at Fidelity maintain that focus on true north, if you will, that it's, it's right. part of your reputation? You know, you're absolutely right. And in recent, we have, we have these issues where, um, unfortunately, we'll get um, sort of put in the mix with all these bad apples, for lack of a better one. I remember Southwest was the same way. People mm -hmm. would have trouble with airlines and, and assume all airlines were bad. Yeah. Not the case, uh, you know, a, a while ago with Southwest. So we try to be there for our customers. So when you have the Brexit issue or when you have you know, different incidents, we are right there on the front lines. We make everything very proactive on our websites. Um, so we're in the customer's shoes all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so we're there for them. And so when they ask us, hey, what about, we're always there. Um, so it, um, it's an uphill battle sometimes yeah. uh, when all the financial services like that. But if you ask um, people about the Fidelity brand, um, it's incredibly high and always has been. And uh, it's something that we've earned and we work really hard at it. And it pays. Uh, the whole notion of transparency with your customers Absolutely. really makes such a big difference. Absolutely. Uh, something that, that I've been learning about the firm is that technology is really at the core and a, yeah. a major differentiator you were just commenting on. Yeah. Uh, what is the role of, of technology, do you believe, as, as, as the firm moves forward? So technology is a huge part of the company. Um, so, so Fidelity has roughly 45,000 people. Um, people think, oh, well, there must be 45,000 people managing money. No, there's less than 1,000. So what is everybody else doing? We have 12 to 14,000 people in technology. It's our biggest function by far. Um, it underpins every single thing we do. It underpins um, the products we offer. It underpins our financials because we can be more efficient. And most importantly, it under, underpins the, the customer experience. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, people want to do things on multiple devices, um, still want to talk to humans where they can, um, but technology is, is it. So we, and we do almost everything in-house, so we don't outsource. Almost everything is in the stack, all the way up from the software, from the hardware to the software to the actual application. Most of it's built by our folks. So technology careers at Fidelity are, are really exciting. It's a 15,000 person technology company, if you think of it that way. And proprietary technology, yep. uh, almost half your workforce. Uh, Fidelity Lab, is that the, the moniker within the company that describes? Uh, oh, that's effort? one of them. One of um, them. But there's FCAT, there's Fidelity Lab, there's lots of centers for applied technology, there's core technology, um, there's innovation pockets. Um, pretty, um, pretty diverse, and of course, in this day and age, I don't know where you draw the line between what's technology and what's not. Because even our marketing folks and our product folks um, and even people like me in HR, at some point we've got to become technologists whether we like it or not. So the traditional perhaps outside in view of financial services where one might think, well, the jobs are in investing and that's the, the place to be. Right. I'm getting the impression perhaps there's a, a, a several different very rewarding career paths within Fidelity. Lots of them. I mean, we have, so technology I mentioned. Yeah. We do have investment management, which is what we're known for. Um, we have incredibly good product jobs. Marketing, particularly in this day and age, is huge, as per your earlier question. We have lots of business support functions, you know, finance, HR, internal audit. Um, we have client services or, or customer services. That's our second biggest population. These are the people in branches, on the phones, dealing with customers all the time. Uh, and then we have a big operations center um, because you can imagine all this stuff's got to be processed. Yeah. So um, seven big families. Um, our success with BU in terms of the many, many graduates from BU that are at Fidelity are actually spread across every one of those functions. Interesting. So we, Interesting. we, we, um, we recruit pretty well at BU from, uh, and, and apply them to all of those functions I mentioned. So as you recruit uh, incoming uh, yes. recent graduates, yeah. uh, MBA, undergrad, yeah. what are some of the core skills you'd be looking for uh, in considering an applicant to, to join the firm. Yeah, so there's no, uh, there's no cookie cutter. Um, it's interesting. I always land on um, sort of a couple different formulas. I look for the three E's. Then you're gonna say, what are the three E's, Bill? Uh, I like look for edge, um, energy, and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. The second category is intellectual curiosity. So people who have demonstrated intellectual curiosity, that's a skill set you need when you get into the real world. Um, Persistence is a big deal. Um, so these are maybe the softer skills, but they're incredibly important. 
Um, collaboration skills. You cannot succeed in any company without collaborating. Um, technical skills, you know, the hot skills now are cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, data science. I'd put analytics with a capital A. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of some core skills. But as I mentioned, I was a liberal arts guy. Um, I would put, you know, the softer skills are as important as the um, maybe the technical skills. And so as you look at the pool of graduates, you're also looking across programs, not absolutely. just professional schools, but the liberal yes. arts, the sciences, yes. computational science, etc. That's absolutely right, yep. Very interesting. Now, if, if uh, in, in looking at and observing your new hires that come yes. forward every year, yes. no doubt you see uh, inherent strengths that can be defined across the group, if you will. Yes. And then perhaps there are maybe some shortcomings where we at BU and other universities uh, could gain some important advice in terms of things we might do better to prepare our graduates right. uh, to be effective when they come to your firm, to Fidelity. Right, so I think when you came to Fidelity in the winter, you shared an interesting stat with me, which was something like, if you survey the academics, they would say 70% of the grads are prepared for jobs. If you surveyed the companies, they might say, no, 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 it's 30%. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that, and, I, and so what are they maybe missing? First of all, they're missing far less than when I graduated. I mean, the students are so impressive, it's, it's crazy. But if I had to pick a few gaps, if that's okay to say, um, they work in an ecosystem, and they have to learn how to figure out how what they do is a part of a broader thing. Um, intellectually cur intellectual curiosity, which I would think, that'd be a skill that, of course, you must have that at colleges. Somehow, when they get to a company, they don't apply that same thing with that they should. Students that different the, the graduates that differentiate them themselves are the ones that ask why. Why is it this way? I'm doing something that connects to who and what are they looking for? Somehow, and this is beyond nervousness in a new job, over time, they're part of a broader ecosystem and they have to learn how to appreciate that. And there's no heroes. You've got to collaborate. So case study work that you do in school, that applies in the workplace. So those would be the areas that are sometimes inconsistent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the partnership through internships that typically often takes place. Yes. The, the role of internships and the opportunities that might surface for yeah. a, a graduate. So we take internships really seriously. I mean, we in this war for talent, we're trying to get ahead of mm -hmm. when they're really ready to join. So we had maybe 900 interns last summer across, across Fidelity. Um, we put a big measure as how many we convert you know, for, for graduating students. Um, we put a big deal, deal of uh, investment into it. Um, we asked them to give us feedback on whether the assignment was good, bad, or average. Um, but interns, internships is a big pipeline for us in the entry-level program. So technology, huge entry-level program, finance, audit, um, and general, general areas. So internships um, are way more serious um, than when I worked, mm -hmm. and at that, that, that point in my career a long time ago. <laughs> Everything's relative, of course. Everything's relative, <laughs> thank you. I feel younger already. Yeah, I, well, I'm glad you feel that <laughs> way, Bill. Uh, uh, the approach to leadership development, so uh, individuals are in the firm, uh, and the how does the process work to help a, a, a relatively new employee or person moving through their, their, their system to, yeah. to really to develop? Are there specific programs, the role of mentorship in this respect as right. well? So we probably have a, a lots of different flavors like other companies do. Um, so we have formal leadership development programs based on different levels and experience levels. Those are good. Um, uh, they, they work pretty well. We've made them bigger than they used to be because they've been so successful in terms of um, the feedback we get and the impact they make uh, once they graduate from those programs. Um, so we're trying to make those um, as big as we can. Um, we have unofficial leadership development, which I think is the most important thing, which is really the role that, that management plays. I mean, to me, I know it sounds cliche, but everyone can be a leader. It's up to the company to help the person develop those leadership skills. And the formal stuff is good, but the on-the-job stuff is great. And it's the simple things, it's exposure. Uh, it's giving them challenging assignments. It's asking them to lead something or partially lead something. And most people rise to the occasion. Um, I'm a huge fan of mentorships. So I've mentored a ton of people. I find it refreshing. Uh, but most recently, what I've done is have, I have reverse mentors. So I have people who are two to three out of, years out of college who mentor me. Mm -hmm. And in this day of um, 
millennials or Gen Z. Um, it's so healthy to hear from them. And this is, they take the leadership and they take the role in the meeting. They book time with me and they tell me what I'm doing well and more often than not what I'm not doing so well. Um, I think that is where the future is going to be, which is this reverse mentoring. Reverse mentoring. It's not because they're one closer. Way. They're closer to the front lines. So I find, those are my favorite meetings. Yeah. Interesting. And how do you deal with uh, risk in the sense of the risk of failure? Uh, clearly, you're managing trillions of dollars of, yeah. of money. Uh, regulations, in many respects, uh, serve to reduce risk taking. Right. How do you create that culture of being willing to take the risk, risking potentially failure? Right. No, it's a hard in that one. That kind of an environment. It's a hard one. Um, we um, we take it seriously in terms of we cannot make a big mistake with, with customer assets. But if you don't make any mistakes, you're not going to have any innovation. So what we've been trying to do recently is have leaders admit their mistakes. So I do it twice a year. I get the entire HR function together. And every single time I say, here's, here's the mistakes I've made since the last time we get together. To try to say it's very refreshing. Um, our leaders do it a lot too. They say, here's things that we should have done better. And that actually helps establish the culture out there. Um, people say, well, that's nice, Bill. But, and I would say, in simple terms, it's OK to make a few mistakes. What's not OK is to keep making the same, same mistake, mistake over and over. Mm -hmm. But you cannot have an innovative culture when people are scared to try different things. Now you've got to put a little parameters around it, but admitting mistakes, being transparent, and quite honestly, rewarding people for the effort sometimes is actually good, even if it didn't turn out to be as well as you thought. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Your personal leadership skill, style, it's evolved. Uh, GE uh, has a historic culture, perhaps it's yeah. a little bit different than Fidelity's. Uh, how, what is your leadership? How would people describe your personal leadership style? That's a good question, actually. They might, um, they might use words like, kind of contagious energy. Um, I definitely think they'd land on intellectual curiosity. Um, I, st I tend to think the last idea is actually can be the best idea. Um, so I don't overly like to plan for things. Um, I very much empower my people. Um, I throw them into situations that they probably think they're going to drown, and they always find a way to <laughs> stay above the water if that's sure. OK. Um, I like to debate things. Um, I like to change my mind. Um, and probably, um, I'm probably a pretty analytic guy, um, if you really ask people. I, I like, numbers generally tell you stuff. Leadership lessons you've learned? Any one or two major leadership lessons, aha moments that you've encountered? The, one, the number one thing is, is people can always do more than you think they can. Interesting. Um, so in other words, take a chance on people. Um, people took a chance on me in my career. People are still taking chances on me. Um, so good leaders. I sort of kind of find consistently uh, empower people and give them a chance, and most of the time they're right. Mm -hmm. Many companies are now talking about or shifting their performance review process from being formal annual oh, yes. written reviews. Yes. It's one of the hot topics in in human resources yes. these days. Yeah. What's what's your view of that? Yeah, I mean, you can imagine the last two years how many articles people have left on my desk or emailed me about company X is getting rid of ratings, they're never going to do them again, and then the next stack says the following X companies are, are figuring out that was a disaster, so they're going back to them. So I'm kind of, um, I've been observing. Um, my opinion on it is, um, is that kids get grades when they're in school. So therefore, I don't know why adults can't get grades. So that's sort of why mm -hmm. getting something is not the worst thing. On the other hand, the, the problem with the system is people get obsessed with the grades or the, or the rankings yeah. Yeah. and not what their manager is saying. Mm -hmm. The second problem with having ratings is you're always compared to relative what you got last time. So if you got a, an A and then the next year you get a B, the first human reaction is, but I got an A last time, so it must be. If you don't have ratings, you can start with a white sheet every time, which is healthier. The last dynamic is if you're not going to have ratings, you have to replace, you have to have something. Simple. If you're going to find out who's the next best person to take the job, you have to have some data. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to, if you have $100 of money to give for bonus and you have to differentiate your folks. So if you're not going to have ratings, you have to have something. You have to have a mechanism of something. I think, beyond yeah. just like a gut feel. So we've tried, we still have ratings. Mm -hmm. We're watching what's happening, but we are divorcing or 
weaning ourselves off the ratings and putting much more time into how that person is doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with a more comprehensive discussion, just like this, with less about here's your, here's your letter so grade. more of a discussion than a the top down yeah. kind of so activity. I'm still on the fence. I, I, I see the pros and cons of each one. But um, in this particular case, I'm kind of seeing what happens out there. What happens next. Yeah. Are the millennials, uh, the new generation, providing any, do they have a point of view at this point? What, they, what they want more than anything else is they want to know how they're doing. Mm. They, they don't get all obsessed with the, the, the ranking or the, or the performance grade. They want to know how they're doing. And they don't want to wait till the annual to, performance review. a year, yeah. They want to say, like, they, they're very impromptu, which I love. Yeah. You know, after a meeting, how did I do? Um, what else could I be doing? They're, they're, they're seeking feedback and not in a selfish way. Mm -hmm. It's very honest. And our manager's got to be prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wish I had a little thing on my iPhone, like a little app that I could send little notes off so I wasn't waiting until, you know, year end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have some work to do, but Interesting. it's you, fascinating. You mentioned the community. It's a very important part of the value system of Fidelity. Big part, yeah. Corporate social responsibility. Yeah. Uh, the efforts that Fidelity puts into supporting the community, supporting the environment. Yes. Uh, what, what drives that? Is this in large part perhaps uh, the legacy of uh, being a, a deep roots family created company yeah. that is really moving forward or, or what, what is it really that provides? I would say it's definitely that. Um, it's, it's one of the values, um, family value of, of, of the family that runs Fidelity. Um, but it's also something that we look for when we bring people in. Mm -hmm. So I, I go through resumes like anybody else. I like to see what people have done in the volunteer category. It doesn't have to be a big thing. I understand students are busy, but that's a little differentiating factor and <clears throat> it kind of permeates its way through. The second thing is, you know, we have very strong relationships with local and state governments in the area and it's a quid pro quo. <clears throat> um, they're looking for us to invest in the community, and we take that really seriously. And we get feedback of what we're doing well and, not, what, and what we're not doing well. And, and we look for them to make it a more attractive um, work environment for our employees. So um, they're part of the ecosystem. The, the local communities are a big part of it. And I got to tell you, the efforts that we do in things like Fidelity Cares to go into a community for a day or a week or do something, it's incredibly motivating for the employees. Mm -hmm. It's networking. They get to meet people they don't always work with. And they kind of go home at night thinking, you know what, Fidelity is really more than just the specific job I'm doing. So pride. Pride huge is pride. a huge impact on, on, huge on pride. the pride equation. Absolutely. Bill, through your career, whether GE, Fidelity, no doubt you've encountered one or two ethical dilemmas. We all do uh, when we go to work. And, and sometimes it happens on the second day of our employment uh, at a very young age. Is there an ethical dilemma you might be willing to share with us where you felt a challenge and you perhaps weren't in a position of, of power, quote unquote. You know, and how did you deal with it? How do you deal with this? We know our graduates, uh, yeah. certainly most often they'll encounter challenges uh, almost from day one. It's part of unfortunately what often happens in, in the world. Right. Is there an example you might want to share with us? Um, yeah, that's a hard one. I can't be too specific. Sure. But um, maybe one that comes to mind is when I was, um, when I had recently joined Fidelity. I was asked by someone to fly over to Japan to check something out. And um, my gut was, I probably should understand what I'm checking out before I actually action it. The pressure I felt as an employee is, hey, someone asked me to go check that out, I gotta do it. So I kind of stubbed my toe a little bit by being maybe a little bit too action oriented because my dilemma was um, scope this out versus execute. and. That was a good learning for me, which is scoping things out. I'm talking about partnership with people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. getting to know people, getting to know the situation, even if that delays the execution by a little bit, mm -hmm. is, is the way to go. I was too hyper to prove myself and not so go really with my gut. My gut said, maybe slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that was a dilemma because trying to prove yourself, you got a gut mm -hmm. and, and go with your gut. If you have the right values, they're in your gut and go, go with those. With it. Absolutely. Very, very sage, sage yes. counsel for all of us. Yes. My gut's not that big. Though, so, you know. <laughs> There's only so much in there. Bill, one final question yeah. for you. If you could offer one piece of advice to 
our students who are preparing yeah. for the world of work, whether yeah. it be at Fidelity, financial service, or perhaps something very different. Yeah. What advice would you have for, for our next generation of leaders? If okay, so I'm gonna give you three pieces of advice. The first, or give them, have fun okay. in what you're doing. You're only in college or university once. Have fun. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. That's my second piece. Okay. Um, you're gonna hopefully do lots of good things over your career. There's no such thing as a perfect career path. There's no such thing as a perfect job. So pace yourself uh, accordingly. Uh, and the third piece of advice is as you're thinking of your next step, you know, check it out. Like go under the covers. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking of joining a company, don't just go on their website. If you can physically go there, see the kind of people who are coming in and out of the building. Buy one of their products. Go on social media and see what people are saying about them. You know, just like, you know, people prepare to go to undergrad or grad, and most of the good ones probably research it. Do the same thing with the company you're going to go to. I'm not saying analysis paralysis, but be creative. Like when you visit a college campus, go visit the employer, not, not just the HR department, but check out who's coming in and out of the building. Buy some of their products. So that's my advice. But the first one is have fun. Above all. Absolutely. Have fun. On that note, we've had a lot of fun in this conversation. We've been in conversation with Bill Ackerman, Head of Human Resources at Fidelity Investment. Thank you for joining us. And Bill, thank you for an inspirational and energetic conversation. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated.